All right, here we go. So conventional fluoro, which I consider different from digital fluoro, which uses a flat panel detector, and that's what we'll talk about in part two. But conventional fluoro uses this big clunky thing. I don't even think they noticed in the last class, but this is our room. Well, it's not our room, our room, but it's a Phillips fluoro room that kind of looks almost like ours. <clears throat> um, so even though it's digital, I still call it conventional, and other people do, because it's using an II tube versus a digital detector. Right? And the II tube, which stands for image intensification, is a good chunk of what we're going to talk about today. So fluoro is getting used all over the place. Right? You've probably seen it if you've seen the GI series or Barry Memo or like a speech pathology study of some sort. Uh, but fluoro is being used with the C-arm in the OR. Uh, fluoro, uh, fluoro is being used with the C-arm for a lot of pain management type of procedures. Um, I know a tech that um, she did like some pain management clinic, and that's like all she does all day. She likes it there, because I guess the people are fun, and they're drunk all the time. So. <laughs> uh, but uh, we're also using fluoro in a huge way in an area that you probably haven't been exposed to yet that you'll get to next year, which is in special procedures, in all those angiographic suites. It's also being used in cardiology all the time, which is there's kind of a weird turf war sometimes between radiology and cardiology. Um, but anytime someone has a pacemaker or a stent put in or has a angioplasty where they put the little balloon and open up the vessel, uh, all those things are done under fluoroscopic guidance and special procedures areas. So fluoro has been around for a while. And the real power of fluoro is not that the images look fantastic, really. Um, they don't. But you get to see moving images, which is really, really important for us uh, to make a diagnosis on certain things. So imagine I have, I don't know, this marker here, right? And I make a little okay sign, but this is a valve in my heart. I don't know, maybe between the ventria and the atria. And I have this going this way. Well, actually, when you look at it, if it's blood flow going through a valve and it's a static image, don't think this is the front. Just think of it as blood going through this thing. Do I really know which direction it's going? You don't. But if you have a movie, you can see it flowing through. And even worse, if the patient has like blood flow that kind of goes through the valve and then regurgitates back a little bit and goes the opposite direction because they have, you know, some pathology, maybe they need a new valve. Uh, that's where the power of cine and movies really help us. Right. So floral allows us to see uh, maybe not the best images, but it allows us the power of being able to link multiple images together and create a movie and see how barium flows through the esophagus on its way to the stomach and then what happens uh, is really powerful for making a diagnosis. And it's been around for quite a while. And Edison, you might think of him as just the light bulb guy, but did you know he created the fluoroscope? Yeah, he did a lot of stuff. Uh, kind of like an evil genius though, because he wasn't very nice to some people. Really ruined Tesla, but that's a different story. Um, but the ability to observe anatomy in motion, right, and, and locate certain structures. So again, you know, when they put that catheter into your groin and then snake it up into your heart, or as they did in my case, all the way up into my head, right, uh, for cerebral angiogram, right, you want them to be able to like see what they're doing and make the correct left and right turns when all these different vessels bifurcate into other places. You don't want them, you know, ended up in your kidney somewhere, unless that's where you want it. So you do all sorts of annual procedures, right? So fluoro is really nice for that versus, you know, a static image. The problem with fluoro is twofold. One, this part really hasn't gone away. It's really, really intensive radiation. Doses are very high. 
Because these procedures, when you've seen a fluoroscopic exam, how long did it last? Was it like, beep, done? No. no. It's a three, four, five, 10, 15 minute procedure with a few minutes or more of actual radiation time, which is huge. So very little MA, we'll talk about that later, but huge on the time. The other issue is that uh, the images were typically very dark. And to try to improve the life of the fluoroscopist or the radiologist or whoever's doing fluoro, only certain people are on fluoro, uh, and not PAs, by the way. Uh, it was dark, so they made the room really dark to try to bring out some of the brightness. Mm -hmm. Uh, we've come a long way. You don't even have to turn the lights off anymore. We're doing that. But the improvement that allowed that to happen in a bigger way is more and better improved image intensifier tubes, which is we're going to spend some time on this. So the II tube looks like this cylinder. You see it in room one, old room four, right on top of the carriage is that big plastic round thing. And it's going to help us. I need to change this picture because that's not a conventional unit. That's a digital unit because it's rectangle versus, versus this thing. Um, so the image intensifier tube will brighten up that image. And we'll see that it's going to do the brightening in a couple of different ways. What makes this lecture challenging is that there's a lot of steps, a lot of conversions, a lot of different phosphor names, but all of it is just kind of memorization. There's no super thinking involved, right? Other than remembering what happens first, second, and third. But the idea is we're gonna start with x-rays. So you gotta radiate the patient somewhere. Uh, and turn it into a visible light image. And the idea is that the image intensifier <clears throat> is gonna take those X-ray photons and turn them into thousands and thousands of light photons per X-ray photon. So we're gonna start off at the bottom and move on up. So this is a C-arm style mm -hmm. unit. Uh, you're seeing more and more of these. Some of them are biplane, meaning you have two tubes. Right? You can do APs and laterals at the same time, more radiation. Coming at you from 90 degree angles, even better. What's your typical floral unit look like? This is kind of a basic unit, right? I call it conventional versus digital because it has an image intensifier tube, not because you don't get digital images, because you do. And what do we have going on here? We have a regular x-ray tube, but for a fluoroscopic exam, we move it out of the way, right? They stick in the corner somewhere. So where's our x-ray tube? It's located under the table. Our image intensifier is up in here attached to this carriage and when you move the carriage around the floral unit or the tube underneath it follows it around right. c arm has the same thing right here's our image intensifier kind of looks like a cylinder and here's our x-ray tube in here patient obviously goes in the middle What else do we have? We have a foot sand because a lot of fluoroscopic studies require the patient to start standing up or at some point move around. And we have a bucky usually, but for fluoro, we don't use it. So we have to move it all the way to the right side. Can't tell you how many times, not too many, because it's kind of embarrassing. So doctor starts the fluoro and like the image comes out dark. 
And you're like, what's going on? It's because you left the buggy there and didn't move it over. It happens. Not too many times, right? Because once that happens to you once or twice, you're like, can't let that happen. And the rest is uh, there's a, a slot here for uh, a spot film. So occasionally radiologists will do static images, uh, but most of those are gone. Uh, if you look at our room, you see like a plastic sheet over it. So it kind of doesn't even really exist anymore. Uh, because physicians can press a button and capture an image while it's dynamic. They see something and move around, they stop for a second and basically make an exposure and capture the image. So they, have us, yeah. they have pedals or, or hand um, mechanisms, buttons, basically. I don't think they have any voice controlled ones yet. That would be kind of cool, though. X ray that. <laughs> I don't see why they couldn't, but maybe you get some like someone would yell X ray when they were doing a portable next door and like. Doing floral and, uh, who knows? So no Google Assistant or Siri or Alexa yet. Um, probably soon enough. Uh, we have some nice monitors. Uh, you don't see the outside of the room, but a lot of the rooms have a monitor on the outside as well as the inside. And that's really it for the equipment. We're going to get into what in, is inside of these things and, and make them tick. But in terms of MA, look how low our MA is. Do you guys remember MA? Remember our tube current? When we do a hand, what's our MA? What's the MA station? Not mass, MA. 100, button, 200, 150, 300. So, if the MA is so low, why is the dose so high? A few minutes. Yeah, minutes and minutes, right? So even at 5 MA, right, that means 5 mass per second, right? So if this thing is on for 3 minutes, 6, 12, 18, 180 seconds, that's 180 mass in three minutes. And the little dopey alarm doesn't even go off till five minutes. Like I think they've had enough at this point. So it's an awful lot of exposure just kind of distributed over a long period of time. <clears throat> right? For us, seconds is a long time, right? Because any set of x-rays is really a fraction of a second. I don't think you spend more than a second on, on a, a complete elbow, let's say, when you add them all up, this doesn't even come up to a second. KV is usually pretty high, uh, and that's because we're using uh, barium, and you need to penetrate the barium in addition to everything else you're penetrating. One of the interesting uh, parts of the machinery is automatic brightness control. Uh, and that's really cool because if you're moving this fluoroscopic machine around, and let's say you're going from the esophagus uh, superior and you're going inferior down towards the stomach, so where's your stomach in your belly? It's going to be a lot thicker. Do you have enough time to run outside and adjust the exposure technique and still get a live fluoroscopic image? No. So this system will automatically, or on the fly as they say, change the MA and or the KV and adjust for the thickness. There's a little bit of a lag, right? If you move the fluoroscopic thing too fast, right, you'll, you'll see a blur and, and it'll take the machine a second or two to like kind of catch up to you, right? Uh, but that's, the, the system basically wouldn't work if you didn't have this built into it. So here's where the fun begins. Inside that big plastic encasement is the II tube or the image intensifier tube. And there are some similarities to the x-ray tube, right? There's an anode side, there's a cathode side, um, there's 
X-ray photons involved. There's electrons involved. There's KV involved. And there's a lot of stuff going on here. This image is not in your book. I felt like going with some different image. Uh, because after all, the registry is not going to be based on any one textbook. I don't know who they have that draws pictures for the registry. What artists? Hi. Need me? Sure. the steps essentially and I'll go over this in more detail but I'll just lay it out for you right now we start with x-rays they hit what's known as an input fossil this thing in yellow there's a bunch of convergence that will take place the very first one in the input phosphor is going to take those x-rays and turn it to light then right after this it hits another phosphor, except this one's not the input phosphor, it's called the photocathode. It's going to take that light image and turn it to electrons. Then, those electrons have to shoot across the entire x-ray tube, going from this cathode area to the anode area, where there's another phosphor except this one's the output phosphor versus the initial input phosphor. And it's going to take that electron image and turn it back to a light image. So it's the second time we're making conversion to light. Except there's even more light here than there was here. here. So it's x-ray, light, electrons, light. X L E L. Is that spelling anything? Kind of like Excel. I don't know. I have to write it down and look at it. Um, then there are a few things in between, which we'll get into. But that's the premise, and we end up with a lot of light, right? Essentially, for every X-ray photon, we're going to get somewhere between. 5,000 and 10,000 <coughs> 10, or so uh, light photons. And then we don't have to like wear crazy red goggles and, you know, turn off the lights all the time. So I'm just going to go over it in more detail. Right. So we start with um, x-rays. They hit the input phosphor. It's made out of cesium iodide. We're in here, right? Uh, and it's going to create a light image. So basically wavelengths of light through a scintillator. Um, and then when it hits the photocathode, we turn it into an electrical signal, basically electrons. So another stream of electrons. Those electrons have to fly across this tube, which is why we have to add in a potential difference, which we've learned is the KV. Not that much KV, just 25 or 30,000 volts. But when we say it, it doesn't sound that much because we say like 25 KV. We're like, oh, 25 KV, well, we can go through a finger. But it's still a lot. You wouldn't want to get jolted by 25,000 volts. So the light image hits the photocathode. So I had that here. So light image, uh, 
from the input phosphor hits photocathode, turns into electrons. Where am I? The photocathode is another phosphor. It's not a scintillator this time, but it's made out of antimony and cesium. Am I recording this? I think so. Or did I forget? Uh, and like we said, those need to fly across little issues trying to get to the other screen. Right. Uh, they hit the photocathode, which is made out of antimony and cesium. And then we have a bunch of electrons that need to fly across and they are aided by two things. One, just like the x-ray tube, there's a general negative polarity associated or negative charge associated with the cathode side that helps push and a positive uh, anode side that helps pull. But it's really the 25,000 volts that shoot them along. We're going to get to the other parts of this. Um, that ultimate second phosphor is much smaller and it's square. So if we go back again, these are like a cylinder, they're round, like a pizza pie. This is more like a postage stamp because it's only about an inch and it's square, which presents some problems, by the way, that we'll talk about near the end. The actual diameter <coughs> of the input phosphor, so the diameter of this, doesn't change directly, but when you read about it, they make it sound like it's changing. And the way the diameter here changes, even though it doesn't like shrink or get bigger like, like Iris like from sci-fi movies, where the door is like swoop open. Uh, changing the charge on the electrostatic lenses, or as they refer to here, the electron optics, will focus this beam of electrons in different ways, depending on the charges. And that is what will change the diameter. But at the same time, regardless of what the diameter is, these are going to be active because they're going to take the electron beam and push it into itself and narrow it down. So the electrons are negative. So these have a positive charge pushing and squeezing the electron beam down. So that's why this thing kind of starts this way and kind of narrows down. Why are we doing this? Just for fun? No. The act of pushing that uh, beam together is going to give us what's known as minification gain. You'll see on the next slide or two. Minification gain is one of the major factors that brightens up the image. Yeah. If the charge is positive, wouldn't it strip out the beam sort of uh, it's whatever so it's I guess no you're right. So it's negative to negative pushes it away, right? So it's a negative yeah, it's a negative charge that's gonna help narrow it down. Thanks. Yeah, if it was if it was the other way, it would like pull it towards the lens. And so that narrowing down is what gives us what's known as minification. And that's gonna help brighten up the image. So at this point. We're getting about 200 photons of light for every X-ray photon, which is an improvement, but nowhere near like the thousands I mentioned at the beginning. When we go from this large, relatively large diameter input phosphor down to a small 
postage size stamp output phosphor. And when we make these conversions from X-ray photons to light photons, X-ray then electrical, then light, we get what's known as flux gain. So between minification gain and flux gain, those two gains, we get what's known as total gain. And that's going to, the, the combination of the two, the product of the two, is what gives us our overall increase in brightness. So I'm gonna flesh these two out a little bit more in the next few slides, a little calculation for each one of them. But when you take the two together, it gives you your total gain. Now when it reaches the output phosphor, it's kind of like, then what? So here's another image. This just has a little bit more to it. So this part, we kind of already went over. Input phosphor takes our, our X-ray, turns it to light. That light interacts with photocathode. Photocathode turns it into a stream of electrons. That stream of electrons starts to shoot across because you're using like 25,000 volts to accelerate them over. But at the same time, they get narrowed down Right by the focusing electrodes, or some books call it the electrostatic lenses. Then they hit the output phosphor, the much smaller square one inch zinc cadmium sulfide exit phosphor. So the narrowing of the beam, the difference between the diameter of the input and the diameter of the output phosphor, that's what gives us our minification gain. Right? Think of that term minification as the size changing between the two phosphors. The flux gain is accomplished by the conversions that are happening between X-ray light, electrical back to light. The combination of those two give us our total gain. So now we get light as our final product right here and where does it go? Well, we have a little mirror system here and some fiber optics. Some of it is gonna go one way and some of it's gonna continue like right through and go another way. So we have what's known as a beam splitter here. And this here is gonna go to monitors in the room, monitors outside the room, and the other side over here is going to go to the computer. It's going to hit an analog to digital converter first because computers, again, don't work with light very well. So you have to take that light image and convert it again uh, to ones and zeros so the computer can work on it. But this way we can save our movies, right? We don't just like hit stop and it's all over and done. So we get a recording. You know what they had before this? A VCR. Yeah, and they just recorded the video that went to the to the room. So you just have to play with the VCR, change the tapes, and write the patient's number on the tape, and like put it away somewhere, and then never find it. Again. <laughs> so digital world has helped uh, a little bit. So. Our minification gain, like we said, is based on diameter of the input phosphor squared over diameter of the output phosphor. So you're going from something that might be between 6 to 12 inches, maybe even 16. Remember, it doesn't actually change size based on the charge on those electro electrostatic lenses. But they call it the diameter. And one important thing to realize is it is a diameter because it is circular. Down to the one inch output phosphor, which is square. Again, that's gonna present some issues. There is no diameter in square. You're trying to trick me. 
The diameter is for circles. It's a one inch by one inch length width square. Flux gain, we said, is based on the different conversions that are happening. So flux gain overall is how many input x-rays did you start with compared to how many output light photons do you get at the end of the day at the output phosphor before it gets to the video camera or the CCD. Questions so far? Just multiple steps and terms, kind of. Right. So we might get about 3,000 as part of the flux gain. But then when we multiply the flux gain with the minification gain, that's where we get our total brightness gain, right, between those two things. And then we're getting, for every X-ray photon, somewhere in between 5,000 and 20,000 light photons. This is why we call it the uh, II tube or image intensification tube. Now your book, and I haven't really heard this term before, so I'm not testing you on it. Uh, they, they're starting, I guess, I haven't really verified this in other textbooks yet. They have a new term for total brightness gain. So instead of total brightness gain, they're calling it the conversion factor. Kind of catchy, I guess. But it's still, in a way, based on the same stuff. I'm not going to hold you to this. Um, they're saying it's a little bit more accurate. Uh, you could read up, it's like one paragraph in the book, not like a whole page of stuff. Um, and it's still based on ratio of output phosphor to input phosphor, right, which is minification gain. Um, and it's based, you know, loosely on brightness level, which is measured in candela, like candle numbers, which I think that in and of itself is an old term. Candela, no one uses that anymore. Uh, versus radiation over time. But again, don't worry about this. Because the minification was input to output. Yeah, minification is input to output. Flux gain and this is, one is output to ratio of the output. Oh, it doesn't matter how you say it. Okay. Right. It's the fact that the the diameters are different. That you're going from larger to smaller. Yeah. Right. So larger on top. Smaller. Yeah. So yeah. It should be. It should be. I guess technically. Uh, input to output, right? Because it's kind of like starting with the, like a wide hose and squeezing it down, right? And you see how much water you get, like the pressure goes way up. So think of that as brightness getting enhanced. So we could change this if, if it makes you happier. That didn't work. I'll change it when I have time. All right. So where's the whole magnification thing coming? So this one requires a little bit of thought because it's not as intuitive, especially based on things we've already learned. So here we said one, that the diameter doesn't really change but we can say it changes based on a different amount of energy applied to those electrostatic lenses. But let's use the word diameter because everyone else does. When you go from a larger diameter to a smaller diameter, you get magnification. So if you go from a 12 to a six, even though the number is going down, the multi-field number as they call it sometimes, you're actually getting magnification. 
magnification is good sometimes, allows you to see more stuff. Except the penalty in fluoro, as you'll see in red, is when you use magnification mode or different modes of magnification, you get double or more the dose. But, and this is the counterintuitive thing, everything we've always talked about magnification, we lose spatial resolution. Here the image gets better. At least you get something for the dose, in this case, is a way to think about it. Right. So, any tube that can do this is referred to as a multi-field or a dual field intensifier. And I really haven't come across any that don't do this. And in the lab, when we play with the machine, actually when I subject myself to the fluoro, uh, you'll see me change the magnification mode. Good? Good, good. Of course, when you magnify an image, right, um, you do lose some anatomy. Right? Part of the image gets big, but you only have a certain size monitor to look at. So when stuff gets bigger, maybe it looks a little bit better. Fluoro overall doesn't look that great. Remember, it's the power in making static images into dynamic images looping things and making them into movies, that's the real power. Uh, automatic brightness control is the same thing as automatic stabilization of brightness. So we've already seen this. Just be aware of the two synonymous terms. And KV stuff. I'm not going to hold you to memorizing all this. Other than two. You should know that when you use barium studies, you're up above 100 kV. I think we've talked about this somewhere. When you use uh, contrast media that's kind of liquefied, not like that chunky, thick barium stuff, so non-ionic contrast, like you would use in a myelogram or iodine procedures in abdomen, you're in the 70s range, 75, 80 in there. Everything else I don't care about. Right? Because they're basically the same anyway. If you, really, if you look at this, it's really like two halves. Right? There's a higher KD for the barium stuff, right? Barium enema, small bowel, upper GI. This is the only one that kind of in between the two, air contrast. But then everything else is in that other range. So is the system perfect? No. We use a lot of fluoro. Like I said, OR, special procedures, all over the place. Sometimes you get some distortion. Sometimes you get some noise. This particular slide is saying, in a nice fancy way, that if you don't use enough radiation, it's not going to work. Right? That's kind of like a given, right? The number of photons absorbed by the image intensifier determines the statistical quality of the image. It should just say, not enough radiation, bad resolution. But this is the way you ask the question. <laughs> True. Yeah. Yeah. There could be like the easy registry and the much harder registry that says exactly the same thing. So my test questions kind of match the window. But um, <clears throat> there are some other rationales for why you would get noise or lower resolution besides not using enough radiation. So before we get to those, if you don't use enough radiation, you'll get noise. So all this slide is saying, kind of picks up where the other one left off. It just says, if you provide the system with more signal, more data, and you get more data if you use more radiation, or at least enough radiation, you get better contrast, right? So going from A to D, 
D looks better because it has the highest signal to noise, it has more signal versus noise, so contrast goes up. The other problems are coming up here. So just like x-rays, light scatters, and electrons don't always go where you want them to go, exactly. <laughs> so uh, in the first part of this, uh, x-ray photons that don't get absorbed by the input phosphor can go straight on through. So what this says is, earlier we just kind of said the input phosphor takes the x-ray, turns it to light. But occasionally it doesn't. And some of those x-ray photons just go on through, right? And maybe even interact with the alpha phosphor. Not that many, but that would be a cause for contrast to go down. It's not working the way we designed it. How about this one? Light photons generated by the output phosphor, instead of continuing in those little fiber optics and going off to the TV camera and the computer, might go backwards. Maybe hit electrons or just not do what they're supposed to do. And that will then also decrease the contrast a little bit. not perfect, right? It's pretty good when you consider the billions of trillions of light photons that are created, right? I mean, if you're getting 10, 15,000 light photons for every x-ray photon, and how many x-ray photons are interacting with the input phosphor, you know, quintillions or something, you know, we're talking about huge numbers. So a few other things, pincushion distortion. Why is this happening? The input phosphor is a circle. The output phosphor is a square. That's why we have some distortion sometimes, especially when you're not using the magnification. See, when you're using the magnification, that helps a little. Right, because it's not just a circle, but it's also concave. Right? Kind of like looking at the top of an eggshell. So if you use magnification and the diameter gets smaller, right, it's a little bit less of an issue. It'll match up a little bit better with the square that is the output phosphor. So this pincushion artifact goes down a little. I don't think the trade-off is worth it. First of all, you might not want to magnify something because you just don't want to. And second, remember magnification increases dose like two or three times. So I wouldn't say, you know, use magnification mode more often than not, just so that this uh, pin cushion artifact would go down a little bit. What you could do is buy a new system, which is our next lecture and go DR flat panel detectors instead of the II tube. One day I won't be talking about this. Not for a while though. Veiling glare uh, is something else that will reduce contrast. And this is based on light scattering. So light scatters, x-ray scatters, electrons don't always do exactly what you want. And there's not much you can do about it. It's just part of it, the system. Not that flat panel detectors don't have any problems either. And my favorite, vignetting, I just like the way it sounds. <clears throat> but it's easy to confuse the two Vs, by the way. One of them will be on the test. Vignetting is an issue where you lose brightness at the edges of the output phosphor. And again, that's really, again, because you're starting off with something that's a circle and trying to get it to be a square and things don't really match up. That's the same problem we have in CR, by the way. I don't know if you read that part or saw it on the video. 
right, where the pixels are square, but the lasers are a circle. So there's like a mismatch kind of. Again, not much you can do with this. Really only the pin cushion that you might have a chance of producing pin cushion. So that's all the hard part. The rest is a few little things about the units themselves. So I use the word conventional kind of two different ways. I talk about conventional fluoroscopy and I'll say it's utilizing an image intensifier too versus flat panel detector. But I'll also use the word conventional and say typically the rooms that I consider conventional are the ones that look like the room we have, where radiologist has to be in the room, they have to grab onto this carriage, the x-ray tube is underneath the table, the II tube fluoro apparatus is on top, and they move it all around. I consider that conventional. You've all seen this. You may have seen a remote room. Remote rooms are pretty cool because you don't have to be in the room. The other difference is it looks kind of like a regular x-ray room because the image intensifier is underneath the table and the tubes above, which is kind of what we're used to. So these rooms are nice. They have like joysticks and they have microphones and speakers and you can, you know, talk to the patient and tell them to, so that's the hard part, you know, oblique yourself. You know, easier said than done, right? You know, if the patient can turn over onto their right side and the, understands the radiologist or whoever's doing the fluoro and, and if, the, if the person says, you know, turn up a little bit higher and they do, all is good. But what if they don't understand it or they're too sick? or whatever it is, then you're going to have to go in the room anyway and position them. And then it's even more of a hassle because you have to walk out to control the thing, unless it has the ability to flow from inside also, which it might, but still defeats the whole purpose. If everything works well, then you're getting a lot less radiation as the operator, right? And you don't have to wear the clunky apron, although you might put it on anyway because you have to run in. But it's kind of neat. That's really the only difference. The image intensifier is underneath the table, but the operation inside, all those conversions and all that other stuff, is the same. Anyone ever see this? For now, they have, but they, I've never seen they use it. They use another room for Flora. Yeah. They have it at Woodhull, too. I mean, it might be, it might work out for other procedures where, you know, you don't have to be in the room as much, or in other words, the patient doesn't have to move too, too many places. Uh, this is what we're used to, right? We're used to the conventional type, IIs on the top, you have some lead curtains that help you with the radiation. You're wearing your apron anyway, put your apron on. And um, for you, uh, luckily we're not in the room as much as we used to be, right? When we were using the spot films where there was that slot that you would be able to put a cassette into, uh, and the radiologist, instead of capturing the image digitally now the way they do, they would capture it on a actual cassette, and you'd have to stand there because they only fit one at a time. So you'd have to be in the room, holding this like nine by nine inch cassette behind you, right, with your apron, behind the radiologist with their apron. Uh, and then when they say, I, I need to do the spot, you hand it to them or put it in the slot. And then when they were done, because maybe you, you take it out and put it in the corner somewhere and hope it didn't get exposed by anything, right, and repeat the process. We still do overheads sometimes. That's different, right? Overheads is fluoro's done, and now you take a few static images the normal way, right? You move the carriage out of the way, you put the bucket tray back, you line things up, uh, and then take a couple of, of images, right? Depending on what the procedure is. They're even doing that less and less now. 
Um, as an instructor, I've had to like sometimes beg and grovel and be like, can you let the students do some overheads? But I am conflicted when I do that because that means I'm adding radiation to the exam. I mean, if they're able to do and make diagnosis and do whatever they need without the overheads, then, you know, really more power to them. Um, so I only do that rarely. Which is unfortunate, though, because you still learn all that stuff, right? You can still do an LA. You learn about doing an LAO, uh, but how often do you have to do it now? Not as much. So right side, don't worry about. There's, by, and they're the same numbers anyway. Um, left side, more important. So overall regulations, skin dose should not exceed 2.2 Rankins per minute. Uh, sometimes with the digital equipment, we actually get uh, a measurement of the dose, right? And fluoro dose gets uh, put into the electronic medical record. There are some differences in terms of how close the the fluoro or the x-ray tube can be to the patient. This is a little scary, right? For mobile equipment, like the, uh, like the CR, you can be 12 inches away. Where, where, where are we normally? 40, right, or more, right? So inverse square law says that's like, well, if we went from 40 to 20, that's quadrupling the radiation. 20 to 10 would make it eight times. But that's not 10, it's a little more. That's like six or seven times the radiation. Just there. But hey, it's a lot. Um, it's all good. You get three extra inches in the department with an actual fluoroscopic stationary unit. Basically, the floor is in the room versus the CR. But we have a nice alarm that goes off every five minutes, and you can hit it like a snooze on your alarm clock and then ignore it and radiate more. And the reason I say that, because it's not really up to you, it's the radiologist who wants more radiation. You haven't really seen this yet, but, and you maybe you won't as much as I used to because we're just not doing as much fluoro. But when the residents, we used to do hours of fluoro. Not all day long, because people are starving if you do it in the afternoon. That's why things usually taper off around 12, 12, 30 or something. They don't want people to starve all day. They just want people to like, miss breakfast or kind of like have a light dinner and such. But we used to do lots of floral, you know, at least in the morning, every single day. Like there was a rotation where you were like on floral for like a week. And then after that, you, I don't know, did whatever. <clears throat> but... Um, where was I going with this? I can't remember. Snooze. Snooze. Right, right. So we would use just lots and lots of, of, of radiation. And uh, oh, now I know where I was going. Now I know. So there were when the residents would come in who didn't know what they were doing, because they were students and learning, just like we are, the floral times would go through the roof because they didn't know what they were doing and they, they took extra time, right? They weren't as proficient right? as, as people who had been doing it for a much longer period of time. So, you know, you'd be hitting that snooze button, the alarm button a lot. But like we said, you know, after three minutes, right? Our mass is like 400 already. Right? Even at, uh, what we say, even at one mass. So imagine if it's five mass, because the number was 0. 0.5 to five, I think, on the slide. Imagine five mass for five minutes at five mass per second. I have to do this. All right. Uh, so that's... Uh, what, so that's five mass. Let's do this first. Wait, hold on. So it's 60 
times five minutes. If 300 seconds times five is 1,500 mass, and that's when the alarm goes And I've seen the alarm go off two or three times, especially in the OR. That's why I didn't talk about it in the last class. Maybe I talk about it in the next class. There's something known as intermittent fluoro. You don't really notice it, but the fluoro turns on and off so quickly that you save a little bit of dose, but you don't lose much, if any, image quality. But it lowers the dose because it just kind of turns on and off. So this number could go down a little bit. Even if you cut it in half, which it wouldn't be that much. Still, like a lot. How much is a hand? Five mass? For the whole procedure, right? it's like doing like several hundred hands on that one patient in that five minutes. But floral is great. Love floral. Um, wouldn't have it any other way. Uh, if yeah, if you think the floral is a lot in GI, you know, wait, wait until like they, you know, you're an angio. And they spend a lot of time, you know, but you have to do it. You wouldn't want to take it away. If they're putting a catheter into your groin, and in my case, in 2013, when they put it into my brain, right? You don't want them making the wrong turn with all those millions of bifurcations, not millions, but all those bifurcations of vessels. You want them to get where they need to get, and you want them to, you know, be able to see really well when they're doing it. How long does it You want them to make yes. I'll push a little bit and then oh, maybe it'll turn a little that way. Yeah, have have right. you guys you watched some of the YouTube videos on, on special procedures? Everything's on YouTube. So. But um, I had to, didn't have YouTube, so I had to actually see it. But it's pretty complex, especially, you know, you get smaller and smaller, you know, as you're going from a nice femoral artery up into like, you know, the basal artery in the head. I think we're almost done. Hold on. No, that's the other video. Where are we? I don't know where I am anymore. Okay. HVL, we talked about this already. We don't really need to know it. I don't know why it's in the chat. Right. But we should remember the definition. Filtration, it's the thickness of filtration that is enough, whatever that means be to reduce the radiation to half of what is first coming out of the tube. Right, this is from last year? Yeah. So last year. Well, that's right, last semester. Well, I've only had you for one semester, right? It's almost over for us, you know. I probably won't see you till like June of, of next year or late May. Unless they have you teach something else. Hmm? No, no, no. In September, you go and you have other classes with other people, and I get a new bunch of people that don't know how to spell extra. <laughs> yeah. And then you might see me for like the registry review or maybe in clinic here and there, but um, yeah. Unless I teach something else. Uh, radiation safety, uh, wear your apron. The gloves are really for the radiologist. You know, if they do need to turn the patient, and it is nice, floral is great because they can get the exact obliquity, right? What's an LPO supposed to be? Angle. 45. Do you take a protractor and put it at the base of their head and look at their nose and try to figure out like exact? No. You just kind of guesstimate. Uh, but the radiologist can actually move the patient back and forth, and they would want to put that clunky glove on to do it. Uh, but they can actually have the radiation on and stop exactly where they need to, where, you know, they remove whatever superimposition or they open up the antrum or whatever it is in, in the stomach, uh, just where they want it. So it is a great tool for, for positioning and, and those kind of things. You know, we're not allowed to use the floral to position. Right? I've seen people do that. It's really bad. Right? Like, I'm going to use the floral to, to make sure I get the hip. So you're not supposed to take an x-ray to take an x-ray, right? 
Uh, so last slide, uh, the fluoroscopic use in the OR or in a lot of pain management clinics are utilized with the C-arm. Anyone see the C-arm yet? Anyone play with the C-arm a little bit? A little bit? There's a series of locks, right? There's a couple comps just on the C-arm. Two of them, actually. Uh, and you have to know how all these things work. Again, I didn't have YouTube. But now I, I, I noticed the other day there's like several YouTube videos uh, explaining how to use the C-arm. Some of them are pretty, would have helped me instead of just being like thrown to the wolves. Uh, but uh, one of the things that's really nice that you can probably get right away is you start AP, but there's a lock over here that will turn this whole thing, and you can get a ladder. Where you just have to turn it. I mean, you have to watch and not hit the table. I mean, there's a lot, the OR is fun, but it's like a whole new realm. Um, you can also move this back and forth. But in terms of this particular lecture, really, it's the II that's the same. Right. The only difference was you have 12 inches versus 15 inches. So that's a little different in terms of the regulation. But the, but it's the same, right? It hooks up to monitors. You have two sets of monitors. Uh, usually they have a hold function where, you know, you take an x-ray here, and then when you let go, it moves over to the right side. Uh, and then you floral light again on the left. Um, it's fun. It could be a little scary. Uh, the, the wheels turn, right, and you can kind of turn them so that they're sideways and then they move back and forth. Um, but one of the things you can't get from this image, you'll get it when, you're, when you look at the CR, is when you're standing here, it's, the CR is like out here somewhere, um, especially if it's extended, and it's really hard for you to kind of see what you're doing. Uh, whereas and you're on one side of the sterile field. So you can't really go around and just like check things out like you can with a portable, right? But the doctor or the surgeon is there and they're like, you see right in front of them and they're like, why can't you get this in the right place? Because they, they don't see the perspective. So, you know, um, you get yelled at sometimes. Um, or you could be like the greatest person and they request you. Right, and like everything's cool, and there's music in the OR, and everything's happening. Right, so it all, it all depends. It's not such, not necessarily a terrible experience, right? You know, um, hip pinnings usually make you hungry, roast beef, all the things. But um, it, it is hard, and there's a whole lot of things on here where you can, you know, uh, and watch some of the YouTube videos. They're actually really good. Um, you know, they're, they're not, you know, professionally made, but they, they show you everything that's on there. So um, use that uh, before you uh, do your comp. Uh, there's usually a, like an R that flips it one way, and then there's an R that mirrors it the opposite way. And um, uh, this C-arm, uh, usually the C-arm has a smiley face on it, on the right side, that actually is meaningful. I won't get it. Um, so that is it for part one. Part two will be this afternoon or Monday for most of you, I think. That's it. Next time we meet in this room, it'll just be reviewing stuff. Did I miss something? Are we good? I'm even on time. All right. Enjoy. I'll see some of you in the afternoon, maybe. I always get confused which section goes where.